Now, welcome back. So I suppose everybody has heard the news that Rafa Benitez is being linked with the Celtic job at this point in time. Whether or not there is actually any evidence to base that on is very questionable and it's probably been led by a fake letter slash contract going around that Rafa Benitez has already pre-agreed to join Celtic as the new manager for the next season. That's probably not going to happen, but we're going to discuss it anyway and discuss a more broader topic in terms of what Celtic should be doing and looking for when they're looking for a new manager. And to do that, I'm joined on the line by Jico James. James, thanks for joining me today. You're welcome. Always a pleasure, Enda. So your thoughts on Rafa Benitez then and the rumors and all that? Yeah, so I, I think it's almost like a um, using a, a one of those red light things where you wave it on the wall and you get a cat to get distracted and chase it. Uh, so I think it's a it's a welcome distraction for supporters at this point, given the 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 living nightmare that we've all been experiencing, and uh, particularly acutely in the last couple of weeks. Um, but but I think it really discusses the uh, you know I'll, 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 the way I'll frame it is it's kind of missing the forest for the trees. Um, so I don't have any particular opinion on Benitez specifically. I mean I think he's he's fine. Um, but I, I think that uh, whether or not it's realistic, my sense is probably not. I think the more important conversation to have is whether it makes sense for Celtic. Mm-hmm. And um, that's where I think a lot of the dialogue I've heard has been, you know, people getting excited. It's a big name. Um, I think it would be a really bad decision, uh, like a epically bad decision <laughs> uh, long term. And okay. uh yeah, so that, that that comes back to so when people talk about Moneyball, um, you know they think stats, they think data, um, but you know d- data is really just <clears throat> excuse me, d- data is really just a, a proxy for for information, and then the analytics domain is to turn that information into knowledge, and what Moneyball represented is really uh, a paradigm shift in knowledge when it comes to sports. And what we know now uh, in the modern era of sports is that managers don't um, make as much of a difference as people think. They are, uh, if, if you think about analyzing what causes success or failure at, in professional sports, by far the greatest driver of that is the resources allocated. It's wage bill. Um, all of the things being equal, uh, wh- where you get these periods of arbitrage, I'll call it, is when you have some uh, sporting enterprises adopting these modern methods and you have others that aren't. Uh, so that, to a large degree, in, in, in uh, many sports is gone, meaning that it's really a question of who's doing it better rather than whether they're doing it. Mm-hmm. In football, it's still a question of you know, it's still relatively early. So you have some small clubs like an Atalanta, you know, uh, Getafe, some other ones that have really been punching above their weight um, because you've got this transition period of the paradigm. Um, so it, in my view, it, it's the, the bigger concern is um, how those resources are being allocated. So you kind of go down the, the decision tree. It's what's your wage bill? That By far, that's the most important question. Uh, secondly is going to be how is that wage bill allocated relative to the the quality of the players so that's where we get into recruitment so that's more that's the next step of importance and then as you go down the next level is well how are those players being uh, allocated meaning that you know tactics selection and normally unless you have people that are really bad at those jobs the the allocation of resources and then the allocation of players, uh, you know, the wage bill is, is, is by far going to be the determinant. And I think that's where Celtic have fallen down, where we've been punching below our weight because we've had really poor decision-making in those two layers, that is the second two layers. And that's been masked by um, domestic dominance over competition that to a large degree hasn't adopted these modern analytical methods either uh, mm-hmm. for most of the nine in a row period. And then uh, on top of that is the wage bill advantage where we, you know, between let's say six to 10 times at different t- periods, 
or six to six to nine times our, our second greatest competitor. So that wage bill advantage allowed for um, relatively poor decision making in those next two levels. Uh, and it's mass. And that, that's where if you do proper benchmarking, the, our decline in Europe is a measurement of that. Right. So when we've been going up against clubs that are closer to us and or allocating resources towards modernizing, uh, we just haven't measured up. I mean, the fact that the fact that we played against uh, Salzburg a couple of years back, what was it, 18, 19, and it looked like we were playing a different sport. Uh, you know, we, we, we look like we were playing Barcelona mm -hmm. against a Salzburg and Salzburg's you know, wage budget is in our neighborhood. Um, so that, that's, that's the paradigm shift here. So if, if, if you get a Benitez in and there's other strategic reasons why I think he's a terrible idea, but if, uh, just getting a competent manager will certainly improve things because of how horrible Lenin has been. <laughs> um, but if we don't get recruitment, right. Uh, and our wage bill is going down because of the calamity that we've had, uh, amongst, you know, the relationship between the support and the club then, you know, and that's where if you look at his track record, um, you know, when's the last time Benitez really did anything of consequence? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, I'll, I'll stop. You go ahead. I don't want to I don't want this to be a monologue. Yeah, no. So in terms of Benitez, the, I think the key point is that I, I do think it's unrealistic. He's coming back from a job in China where he was getting paid 12 million a year to work there. Celtic aren't going to pay him that. And also one, one, the one thing I would say about Benitez is that he's largely been working in clubs where his objectives are a lot less than what they were in previous years. So the likes of Liverpool when he was working there and Valencia to a lesser extent, he was expected to win things. So he had the Arsenal behind him, he had the money and he had the facilities there. At Newcastle, he didn't. He did still reach his objective, but it was a different objective of staying in the league. But my worries for Benitez would be that he wouldn't develop the club any further than a year, two years down the path. And that's what really your issue here is with these managers. They're coming in, they're fulfilling a role. They're definitely probably going to win a league, going to win trophies. But after two, three years, that peters out. Yeah, so that this is this is where we get into the paradigm shift. So the what, what I think most... Uh, you know, and, and again, this is just anecdotal. I have no way of quantifying this. But my experience, my anecdotal experience is that the vast majority of Celtic supporters still believe in the manager as God model. Uh, and I put God in quotes, small g, um, which is uh, they're omnipotent. Uh, they should be selecting the players. Uh, they should be building the squad. And then they should all, you know, j the Jock Steen model, basically. And before the paradigm shift of Moneyball, meaning that uh, let, let, I, I like to use an analogy here. You know, analogies are effect can be effective when you when you're introducing a concept the first time. So, um, uh, molecular biology became a thing in 1951. That's when we started to look at actual, you know, looking at medicine through the lens of. Uh, uh, the biology of molecules and cellular biology. That, that, was a, that was a paradigm shift in medicine. So if you were a doctor who went through medical school in the 30s and 40s, you weren't trained within that paradigm. So by, let's say, 1957, 1958, if I'm running a hospital and I want someone to lead my doctor group, do I want someone who's trained in molecular biology and has had some of that training in medical school and in practicing medicine, or do I pay a lot of money for the best doctor of 1942 who hasn't had any of that training? Maybe they're trying to learn it, but their culture is one of, and maybe they were the best doctor at doing things before they had the information and the knowledge that came along with molecular biology. So that this is what I'm, when I talk about a paradigm shift, um, the Benitezes of the world, the, the Jose Mourinho's of the world, um, th these are managers who thrived in a, a, a bygone era. That, that era is dead. And, and the idea that you can, this is, comes back to domain expertise, the idea that a, um, and, and, and you know, think of them as kind of related silos of responsibility. 
with the data and information that's now available, clubs need specialists in analytics in order to take that information and leverage it through rec for recruitment, for example. Mm -hmm. So the idea that someone like Benitez is going to be uh, better than a team of physicists who have been trained and spent their entire training in life thinking about how to analyze things at a level that is just far beyond what football managers think. I mean, it, it's just different um, that he, he can compete with that it is, you know, patently absurd. So yeah. that's where you, you've got clubs that are, they're, they're building um, uh, specialized teams of analysts in order to generate that information for the manager, and I'll call it the head coach now. That's the model. We're moving towards a model of um, specialization in uh, the domain expertise of clubs. And uh, so, you know, Benitez has no track record operating in that model. Um, he would come in just like, I mean, he did not, I mean, I think his club in China was ninth. Um, I mean, I don't know the wage structure in China. I don't know if that's under or overperforming. You said his job at Newcastle was to keep him up. Well, Newcastle's wage bill, he, he overperformed that a little bit in the, mm -hmm. in, in his two years in this, in the, um, the table. But if you look at, you know, again, expected goals and, and kind of expected points, which is, you know, looking at things through the lens of underlying performance. You know, he, he was he didn't do that much better than what you would expect. Um, so I, I just see it as the wrong man for the wrong job. And if we don't get the the structural uh, things addressed, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd rather have somebody. And, I, and to me, it's it's uh, a competent person who's worked in a modern setup, whoever that is. Yeah. To, to me, um, is, is a far better fit longer term, assuming that Celtic get the other part of this correct, which is the bigger one, which is getting someone in to run their football operation who understands these issues. Yeah. I think the key point here is that, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're not trying to eliminate the role of a head coach here because I think a lot of people will come back at this and say, well, data ana analysts and, and scientists don't know the game. They don't play the game. They've never experienced it. And you can't just teach that. But I think what the key point here is that you you want a man who understands tactics, football, has done his coaching badges through the game, has experience, but also buys into analytics and knows where you can leverage it and leveraging it correctly on the field. For example, how Brendan Rodgers and James Madison name check the analyst during the game, like Brendan Rodgers is doing now. He clearly understands the game, has a good base in tactics, but also buys into modern structure of football. Exactly. And, and that's where I, I'll challenge your comment in one way, meaning that during these periods of paradigm shift, I'll go back to my analogy, um, uh, uh, you know, a first year resident in 1957 uh, will know more about medicine than the best doctors in 1935 mm -hmm. because there's been a paradigm shift. They, they know, you know the, the development of molecular bio biology was so transcendent that information that was now available improved the decision making and what they were doing medically to such a degree that someone who's less trained, less talented, um, you know, just has more information. And, and that that's the level of transcendent that's launched in the last um, even five years as, as things like machine learning are being introduced. And, and that's where, uh, you know, I've, I've heard people talk about, well, you bring Benitez's or somebody like that uh, as, a, as a transitional person, you know, and, and as we modernize the 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 back office, let's call it, or the football operations. I think the challenge with that is that someone like Benitez, are they willing to come to Celtic for the, the reasons you give, or even an Eddie Howe, are they willing to come to Celtic for the money, but more importantly, in my mind, the money's not irrelevant, but far less consequential. It's that dynamic of power and who's making decisions and whether or not the manager is both familiar and comfortable working within the model of a head coach, right? Where their job is man management, 
it's it's not that they're outside of that decision making tree the modern decision making tree it's that they're they're a cog in the machine it's building a system of decision making that's robust you know it's like the, why do you have the scientific method well because you don't want people winging it you need yeah. a method right you need a robust system and and that the head coach is a vital part of that system but this is where i go back to that you know the idea of manager is god that's not a system that mm-hmm. that's and and really that was the context that rogers came in under and 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 i think rogers is a fascinating case study in this because he was a manager who had displayed you know, kind of a high level of aptitude under a Jock Steen regime, right? So in that old model, he clearly was a talented manager. But what he's done is he has been ambitious and understood this paradigm shift and embraced it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you know, maybe some of that's personality, ambition, blind ambition in some ways maybe. Um, but youth plays a part of that. Again, Benitez is 60 years old. So what's the likelihood that he's going to embrace this at his age. Um, and he's had those problems. I mean, he's had problem with boards and, you know, uh, power struggles, basically. Uh, going back to even Chelsea and, you know, his, his prior time. So it, to me, it's, it's really shouldn't be a difficult um, decision. But again, this is where the par- if the people at Celtic haven't embraced this paradigm shift or understand it fully, um, or the consequences of it and how it aligns strategically with uh, reforming the club and restructuring the club, you know, and, and there's business interests here that there's putting butts in seats or putting butts yeah. on streams <laughs> for next season early um, and securing revenue, which again is, is another issue because of the, the financial decline that the, the clubs in the midst of, which we'll probably get the accounts here in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, so uh, worrying times. Uh, one counterpoint that I would like to put to you, and it, it's just the way that the game is set up, and maybe an explainer of why that godlike system still exists. It's because, regardless of who that manager brings in, be that the best analyst in the world or rocket scientist or whatever, ultimately, if the process doesn't work or the results aren't seen to be turning around in the fast enough period, it's the manager that gets the sack. It's his job on the line and that is still the way the football is structured yeah and, and that that's uh that's what we call friction <laughs> so that that's why the power needs to come out of their hand uh because they're they're only thinking short term so that that's why the model uh, putting uh an, an architect in place who builds these kind of systems um and, and again, if you think about that role of, let's call it a director of football or sporting director, you know, president of football operations, uh, you know, a term in U.S. sports as general manager, what, what, however you label that, uh, if you look at the qualifications for those people, they're, they're completely different. They're, they're, um, they're running an operation. They're almost like a COO level arrangement. Um, mm-hmm. and, and just by def- culturally, would a woman ever have that job in men's football. And, and well, how does that even make sense? Right. You're going to tell me because of their life experience that there's not, women can't be qualified to build operations in a men's football club. And we actually just saw that again, baseball has been on the cutting edge of a lot of this movement in the last 20 years is the Miami Marlins uh, hired a woman this past, I don't know, four or five months ago, three or four months ago to run their baseball operations. That's progress. That that's understanding, you know how these things work, and and so th- this is not the, the footballing part is obviously still incredibly important, um, but there's way too many things going on here in the modern sporting enterprise uh, that's w- that's beyond um, a, a manager um, that should control. And if you think about this, it'd be like if you're running a company and you have a you know. Um, uh, you know, so, someone down the food chain. Um, and, and that's really think about when you think about decision making, when I just went through that decision tree of what what's most important, if you go wage bill, squad, and an on the pitch, well, to go back up in the decision tree and having the person control those things on the way back up uh, w- without the expertise in those different um, um, areas, 
it, it, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, just logically, it doesn't make sense. Um, so I, I get your point, but it's incentives. So man, mm -hmm. managers are responding to their incentives. And if you got, we have to get off this hamster wheel of, you know, we hire a new manager. Well, they want all their new players. They want their players. They want to play their system. They want to do what they want to do. And the costs of that are crazy. What, you know, every two or three years, you're going to rebuild your squad based off of what, what the, uh, each manager coming in wants. And that, that's the old model. Doesn't make sense. Yeah. So, uh, and, and it, this is not to say that there aren't, there isn't a spectrum of competency within those roles on the technical side or on the operation side. Of course there are. Uh, so we see that with Chelsea, you know, they have not been run all that well up the food chain. So they keep having managers fired because they're not getting the rest of the business right. Whereas you have other clubs that are run, you know, well or very well up that food chain and the manager is less important. Um, you know, you look at a Salzburg, you look at what Leipzig's done as they, you know, some of the, you know, then the Germans have been kind of on the forefront of this, um, where they just kind of plug these managers in and magically the, the machine keeps running. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, shocker there that the Germans are good at engineering, right? Uh, yeah. So just before we finish up again, you, you mentioned baseball and how it has played a massive role. And I suppose for people to translate that over to football, Brentford are a good example of a club that took the Moneyball system, scrapped their academy, and that's how they're running the club. And currently they, they missed out slightly on uh, promotion from the championship last year. Very unlucky, actually. Probably d mainly deserved to be there if you look at West Brom now. And again, they're pushing for championship promotion again this year. Thomas Frank, is he someone that you would see as a potential man and potential system of people that could Celtic could take over and uh, apply to their club? Yeah, I, I think it's a to me it's less. And again, I, I don't I don't pretend to know the profiles of these uh, operational people at football clubs. I mean, um, was name Ragnar Ragnarik or however you pronounce his name from Ralph Ragnick. Ragnick, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, he's kind of the 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 big name that everyone talks about based off of what he's done. Um, but uh, you know, to me it's about profile. It it's so it's it's oftentimes um, you know, someone who's highly educated. I mean, th this is an intellectual firepower um game. Th this is not, you know, uh what experience you have playing the game uh on the operation side and building of a, a football operations. And, and that also doesn't mean that, you, you know, it should be run by a nuclear physicist, the, mm -hmm. the entire business. They need to also have interpersonal skills and, and being able to deal with uh, team building. So, you know, if you look through, again, if you look through the list of baseball general managers and, and presidents of operations, they tend to have a similar profile. A lot of them have gone to Ivy League schools and they were captains of their baseball team at Harvard or they were captains of their baseball team at Yale. And they, you know, they weren't good enough to play professional baseball of any consequence. Some of them have minor league experience, but then they quickly transitioned into uh, the industry of baseball, let's say, and worked their way up through on the operation side. So uh, in my mind, you know, again, football is a little different because college athletics is, is you know, a, a different situation. But basically the profile should be someone of a high intellect, someone who's clearly intelligent, who has experience in on the operation side in a modern operation. Uh, so so somebody from a Brentford, somebody from a Mitchell land, obviously related, uh, you know, the, 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 the Red Bull franchise, um, Liverpool, you know, so the way it, the easy way to think about it is is to poach talented people there that might be blocked right so if there's somebody great at salzburg making decisions and they're 40 years old we'll go hire the their 33 year old number 2 um and bring them in now the one consideration is there are cultural issues here i i don't pretend i don't think that you just take smart people and plop them in glasgow and think that they're going to succeed um, there are considerations here that need to be taken. So maybe someone from Brentford who's British or English or, you know, Scottish would be a better fit than plopping a, you know, picking a German from some other 
and and plopping them down and to run a, a staff of of a bunch of you know um, uh, British locals. So there's there's other considerations here, um, but you know it, it, th that intellectual part is is paramount and that experience of understanding the paradigm shift. And again, that's where I go back to my analogy. You know, uh, the the great director of football from 15 years ago, if they haven't grown with the times, if they're not trained in these modern uh, methodologies and practices and best practices, you know, this, this is why typically from a, from a risk perspective, going with younger people that have been ingrained in this culture from the beginning. And it, it back to Lampart, right? We, we saw that this week with Lampart. Some of the reporting is that inside the dressing room, the young players you know, and to all, by all rep accounts and reports, Lampard's a pretty smart guy. Uh, so, you know, the fact that this new methodology, this way that he might be doing things might conflict with some of the older players, that's not surprising. Because uh, we're, again, we're in this paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. So just before we finish up, I want to throw one more name at you. Yeah. Brighton manager, Graham Potter. Took Ostersons, again, you're looking at the wage bill and overachieving. Ostersons were way below where you'd expect. And he was the last British manager still managing in Europe last year, or a couple of years ago when he was managing them. And now Brighton again. And Brighton are a real frustration for me because I consistently have to talk about them and how badly they're playing and how they're just above the relegation zone. But on XG and performance they're massively overachieving in terms of where you would expect them to be. Yeah, I, I think Brighton is very interesting. I think he's very interesting. That is more along the lines of a profile. Now, again, I, I, don't, I don't pretend to know any of these people. I haven't analyzed managers to any significant degree. Uh, so this is a relatively superficial viewpoint that I have. But from a starting perspective, you think about, again, best practices in, in, in doing analysis. If I'm going to uh, screen my universe down from all of the potential managers in the world and filter them down into a group that look interesting where I my due diligence and I'd say, hey, let's look at this one closer. That's a profile to me. You know, somebody like, um, I, but th this is the other practical reality now, right? So, which is, is because of the mess we have in our background, if I'm a, if I'm a modern young manager and I'm looking at Celtic right now, it does not look like an appealing job unless there's some kind of structure put in place where I understand who that role is going to be filled by. And I have confidence in that new person, i.e. would he, the guy Brighton want to come in and work for Peter Lawwell, mm. not if he's sane. Uh, not, you know, that, that structure, it does not make sense. That could be a, you know, a major detriment to his career come walking into a situation, um, given the paradigm shift and where we're at in this. So, um, you know, Jesse Marsh at Salzburg, would he come to Celtic and, you know, now he's going to go to a Bundesliga side or, or somebody, you know, through that channel that's running a modern operation. And they, you know, from a selfish perspective, that's, you know, a smart decision that they would make. Um, so I, I think it's a real struggle, uh, until we, this is why I say the more important decision now is who do we bring in, in that architect role and the, you know, the decision, which, you know, it seems like this is probably the direction that they're going is that Lawwell is going to be moved somewhere or, or leave in some capacity and get moved out of this kind of pseudo director of football that he's in or so, yeah. whatever the mess is. You know, whatever Ham and him and uh, Lennon, whatever that triangle of decision making has been <laughs> that seemingly hasn't worked, um, then, you know, that that needs to get fixed. That's that's the big one. Um, so, well, we shall find out probably this week, maybe depending on the from, review from your it, lips to his ears. Yeah, maybe if, I, uh, if 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 the review was actually happening, which well, it should have been. Right. Yeah. So that that's again where I, I don't think they'll make I think part of why this is taking so long. Um, forget about the Lenin piece. Uh, that, that's a whole separate issue. But I, I think some of these things have been, probably been in the works for the end of 10 in a row. Mm -hmm. You know, the hope for 10 in a row, the assumed 10 in a row, maybe. And that they were going to, you know, go through this restructuring at the end of the season one way or the other. 
And now because of the train wreck that this has become and uh, what that's done to uh, pressure from uh, supporters is uh, I, I think they're trying to get to that line. Uh, so they've been, you know, using kind of delay tactics, shall we say, to try and smooth things over. Uh, this is why I'm sure they're welcome. They welcomed distractions like Benitez and, you know, some some of these other things where people start talking about other things other than how horrible the decision making's been and the fact that we're going to lose the league this season. Yeah. Um, so they're they're trying to run out the clock. <laughs> they're they're trying to get to May. Well, at the minute they just keep wishing everybody happy birthday on Twitter. It's uh... It was about five happy birthday tweets in the last day and a half. I didn't know there was that many birthdays happening. But uh, yeah, life goes on after the 10 in a row with or without it. So we shall see what happens if the future of Celtic and who shall take over after Neil Lennon is gone because realistically he probably is gone. Hopefully he's gone by the end of the year. I I, I cannot imagine a scenario where that doesn't happen at this point. Um, e- even if... Uh, I, I can't imagine a modern... Uh, director of football coming in and, and making a decision that that they would retain Lennon. Yeah, I'd be shocked. Anyway, James, thanks a million for that. You bet. All right. Cheers for watching. If you want to listen or watch to any of that, you can listen on the Huddle Breakdown uh, on Twitter or on our YouTube channel as well. Subscribe down below, and we'll be back again with another episode soon. Chat to you later.